Hey everyone, uh, Mr. B here. I'm gonna do a series of some shorter kind of, I guess, lectures, lessons, whatever you'd like to call them. Um, everybody's home now, so hopefully you'll be able to see these. I'll have them up on announcements and under content on D2L. Um, I would suggest that you just watch them and listen to them best would probably be during normal class hours. So that would be 1102, uh, 76, 86, and 08. So um, the last reading assignment I gave you all was by William Faulkner, and it was A Rose for Emily. Um, <clears throat> today we're not going to really talk about the story too much in this video. I'm just going to do what I would, well, as close to normal as what we would do in class, which means I'm going to talk a little bit about the author. So William Faulkner um, is uh, pretty much a giant, in, in, in my opinion, is and, and many other people's opinion, uh, a giant in American literature. Um, he was born on September 25th of 1897 in Mississippi, uh, New Albany, Mississippi. He died in 1962, uh, also in Mississippi, um, age 64. So he was rather young uh, when he died, but during his life, um, he made a huge impact on the world of literature and pretty much continues to this day. Um, he, if when it comes to awards, you know, we're all about awards. Oh, who's going to win the big one this year, the Academy Awards and all that? Um, he won two Pulitzer Prizes, uh, which is pretty much unheard of for fiction. I think there's two other people. I know John Updike won one and uh, twice, won it twice, and somebody else did, but off the top of my head, I can't remember. I'm, I'm pretty sure he's one of three people to win two Pulitzers for fiction. Uh, of course, you can Google it. Um, he also won the Nobel Prize for Literature, so he was a Nobel Laureate, and this was all during his lifetime, although I think his second Pulitzer was posthumous. I think, I think it was after he, he died, or, or the National Book Award, one of them. Anyway, if it's a Lit Award, uh, he, he won it, and most during his lifetime, uh, which is a relatively short lifetime. I mean, 64 is, is rather young. Um, but he also did other things. Uh, he, wrote, he, he went to Hollywood for a while and wrote screenplays. Uh, depending on what you believe, most scholars, and I'm by no means a Faulkner scholar, so don't, I'm not claiming that, uh, but many people think that the reason why he started writing screenplays was simply because he needed money. He, he did have a quite a lavish lifestyle. Uh, he liked to live in a big, you know, mansion, and uh, he, he, liked, he liked money, and when he needed it, he'd write stuff for Hollywood. Uh, the only one that I can remember that, that sticks out to me is he did write the screenplay for The Big Sleep, which was kind of a detective noir type uh, film in 1946 with uh, the detective Philip Marlowe, who was created by Raymond Chandler, um, also a, a, who was a very famous crime novelist. So yeah, he dabbled in a lot of stuff. Um, he was also a poet. and. In my personal opinion, uh, I, I'm not a big fan of his poetry, but his literature does stand out, and it's not something that I would normally just pick up on a Sunday afternoon and read, but I highly respect what he did. I mean, he, he's, you know, we throw that word genius around like it's, whoa, so-and-so won the lottery. He's a genius. Well, no, he scratched a ticket. Yeah, that doesn't make you a genius, but um, we, we use that term loosely these days. Uh, in my estimation, this man was a true genius with uh, words and, and just as a writer. Um, what he's somewhat known for is his use of what we call stream of consciousness, and stream of consciousness is a narrative style, a, a viewpoint, if you will, that the best way I can describe it is that uh, it's an attempt by the writer to try to mimic on a page 
how a person is thinking. So the thoughts that are running through that, that character's mind. And, you know, if, if you folks are anything like me, our, our thoughts are not punctuated. I, do, I don't punctuate my thoughts. My thoughts go all over the place. I, I, well, you guys are in my class. You know that. You know my thoughts go all over the place. But um, it can look very confusing because that's kind of how we think. Uh, you know, we could be thinking about, oh, i got to stop by the grocery store and pick up whatever on the way home from work. And then the next millisecond, we're thinking about a trip we took when we were five years old. You know, so that's, that's the basic gist of how stream of consciousness uh, works and what it's trying to mimic. So that's how Faulkner would write. Um, and yes, as a reader, it can be very confusing. It can be extremely confusing. Um, some other famous authors that use the technique, the, the, the viewpoint, narrative style, whatever you want to call it, uh, Virginia Woolf used it somewhat. Um, James Joyce used it to, I believe, its limit. If there is a limit, Joyce probably reached it. Uh, if not in Ulysses, then for sure in Finnegan's Wake, which I, if someone tells you they know what that book's about, please, please give me their number. I'd love to chat with them. Uh, so Faulkner was, is, is a heavyweight. He, he's a heavyweight in American literature, and I would just say in, in literature, period. Um, most of his themes throughout his, his career dealt with the South, uh, particularly the Old South, kind of the, the fall of the Old South, the decay of the Old South, versus the, the rise of the New South, you know, kind of antebellum type stuff, post-Civil War. Um, some of his characters were uh, alive during, you know, before, during, and after the Civil War, so in, in certain stories. Um, so you would see it from different perspectives. You'd have characters who were who were born post Civil War, antebellum, uh, and characters who had been alive before, during, and after. Many uh, characters, well, not many, but some characters who actually participated. Uh, so you got many, diff you know, a, a, a host of viewpoints, and in his novels, particularly, not so much his sh short stories. Um, Although As I Lay Dying does have multiple viewpoints, but uh, in his novels you get many different viewpoints. You know, you'd have one section narrated by a particular character, then a, a, a following section would be narrated by a, by a different character. Um, he had uh, genealogies, you know, for certain families, uh, the Compsons, the Sartoris family, as you'll see in, uh, you know, as or saw, if you've already read A Rose for Emily. The Sartoris, Colonel, Sartor <clears throat> Colonel Sartoris is mentioned several times. Uh, these families existed throughout uh, pretty much his entire body of literature. Um, so you'd have characters from different, and, and different decades, different years, you know, these characters would run throughout. You, you might see the, the grandmother in one story and then in, in a different section of the same story, it might be a, a grandchild or, or something. So he built a whole, um, pretty much a, an entire uh, county in Mississippi. It's a, it's a fictional county. And I can never, ever say the name right, but it's basically Yakna Patafa. And I believe I said that right. I, I always mess it up. It's Yak Yakna Patafa County. And uh, some people, many, you know, scholars of Faulkner say that that was a representation, a fictional representation of Lafayette County, Mississippi, which he was very familiar with. Um, and that would make sense. You know, a lot of writers write what they know. Um, in my opinion, many, that's what great writers do. They might change, you know, the names and places have been changed to, changed to protect the innocent type stuff. Uh, but it was he made it alive. I mean, he made this a real place. He made these characters real people. They were three-dimensional. They weren't cardboard. 
uh, the characters, while they could have symbolic elements to them, uh, represent larger, you know, larger concepts, larger groups of people, larger places in life. The characters themselves, to 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 me, were always individuals. They're they're believable. They, I read the read the stories, I read the books, and I I believe these people. I, I think these people are, are you know they're they're fully developed uh, when I read them, which is something that I can greatly respect about his writing. Um, it's difficult. Now, uh, the story that I gave for y'all to read, A Rose for Emily, on the Faulkner difficulty scale, I would say that, that this story is probably about a three on the difficulty scale. Um, you know, The Sound and the Fury, for example, when I was talking about uh, earlier, when I was talking about the uh, stream of consciousness perspective, uh, the first section of The Sound and the Fury is told or narrated, I should say, by a character named Benji. And Benji is a, is a member of the Compson family. And Benji is a 33-year-old uh, grown man who has uh, roughly the mental capacity of about a four, three, three to five-year-old. Um, he's severely mentally disabled. And um, he can't talk. He he can he can make sound he can make sound but he can't he can't form words he can't talk, um, so the opening section of the sound and the fury is entirely from this this man child man child if you will, from his perspective and and Faulkner was writing it in this stream of consciousness style to to mimic um, how Benji how Benji's world how the world was to Benji. So it's, it's incredibly difficult. I mean, the first time I had to read it, it was actually, believe it or not, I made it all the way to graduate school before I had to read The Sound and the Fury. I didn't read it in my undergrad. Um, and I told my professor, it was Dr. Hafen, I said, Dr. Hafen, I've never read this before. And I was the only person in this graduate seminar who'd never read it. And they were kind of, ha, ha, ha. You know, who's this guy? You know, oh, he's from Georgia State. Uh, they, they must not do real lit there. She said, well, great. She was thrilled because everybody else had read it but me. You know, a class of 12 people, I'm the only one who hadn't read it. And she said, please just get through the whole thing and go back and read Benji's section after you've read the whole book. And I said, I will, I will do that. And, of course, while I was going through Benji's section, it was super frustrating. You know, he does, he might be narrating, and there's very little punctuation, too. That That is another part of stream of consciousness. Like I said, it just goes on and on and on, and it can jump through time. It can jump through space. It can change perspective with no warning. Within the same stream of, uh, of words on the page, it could be, in Benji's case, you could be, as a reader, you could be reading, you know, uh, one page, and you're... 50 words into it, and it's the 33-year-old Benji talking about or thinking what he's seeing. And he'll see something or smell. Smell is very important. He'll smell something, and all of a sudden, he'll be narrating something that happened when he was six or seven years old. But there's no transition. You, you the, As a reader, you're not aware that that transition has happened. However, after you read the entire novel, if you pay really close attention and you go back and read Benji's section again, you can tell generally, roughly, what point of life he's in, how old he is based on who he's with. You can tell sometimes where he is by what he smells. You know, so it's, it's, it was very frustrating for me. I, I wanted to put it down, but I knew I had to keep going. After I finished it and reread the first part, I, I was floored with, I, I just thought, man, this is absolute genius, how well he tied all this together, Mr. Faulkner. Um, so, I really, truly do think that this, that he, as a writer, is, is a genius with, with words and language, um, particularly with, you know, with, with The Sound and the Fury, which, by the way, was his first novel. Um, and this particular story that I had uh, you, you all read is A Rose for Emily. Um, I'm going to get more specifically into that story 
with the next little video session I do. Um, however, if you watch this before you've read the story, or if you want to go back and read the story again, uh, it's not, not going to hurt you. It's only 11, 12 pages long. Here are some things to think about. I'd always, you know, when we were actually in the classroom, I'd say, hey, here's a little food for thought for next time. Um, when you're reading this story, some of the things I'd like you to think about are uh, the, the theme of the, the Old South dying, the decay of the Old South and the rise of the New South. Now look for actual symbols of that in the story, such as the house. Um, think about, kind of just in the back of your head, keep Toby in mind. Think, think, think about Toby and his motivations. You know, why did he leave? Why did he sneak out? Um, and I don't, I don't want to plant too much stuff in your head because the best way to, in my opinion, the best way to read Faulkner is kind of with a little guidance, especially for a story like this, you, I would say a little guidance. With Sound and the Fury, I'm so glad that, that Dr. Hafen told me to just go through it and reread it. Um, but for this story, just look for these. Look for the the old South dying, the decay of the old South, the rise of the new South, um, and outsiders. Outsiders. That's very important in this story, and I just mean people who are outside. I literally mean outsiders. So think of Homer Barron. Think about his role in the story. And other than that, just read it and go from there and I will stop this right now and uh, hopefully this will help you and I will just keep doing these I'm gonna go ahead and assign some more stories and I will do introductions like this and follow-ups with that focus only on the story right now I'm just talking about Faulkner and his career and a little bit of background so for the next one I'll actually talk about a rose for Emily so in closing, I really hope you guys are doing okay. I hope everybody's staying safe. Look, you guys know I'm kind of a rebellious kind of guy. Follow the rules. This is nothing to play with. Just stay safe. And hopefully I'll hear from you all soon. Bye-bye.